expression is also being recorded. Okay. All right. Thank you. just unmuting myself. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second session of the Generation Equality Mexico Forum thematic session on the Compact on Women, Peace, Security, and Humanitarian Action. I'm Jane Ferguson. I'm delighted to be here. I'm coming, uh, coming into this, uh, to this uh, session from Yemen, so please forgive me if, if the internet is a little bit crackly at times. Today, there are literally hundreds of people from all over the world joining us from representing different age groups, genders, nationalities, religions, abilities and experiences. Discussing today will be completely new and there are many others with us who have been working on these issues for years. So the one thing that unites us is that we want to learn more and do more to achieve gender equality and peaceful, resilient societies. And how we do that is exactly what we'll be talking about today. But before we get into the discussion, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping issues about how to talk and how things will run today. Today's event is being recorded. We also have interpretation available for English, Spanish, French, Arabic, and international sign language, as well as close captioning. Today, we are incredibly fortunate to have experts and leaders who have been strong, public champions of these agendas joining us to share why they feel this compact is important and what they hope this compact will achieve. We'll have a moderated interactive discussion followed by a brief question and answer session where all of you are welcome to share your questions and comments in your language using the chat feature. We will do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can and for that I'm going to ask our presenters and discussants to please keep to the time limits. Finally, the ultimate goal of the compact is to really push everyone to achieve progress on the issues we will be discussing today. And the compact cannot do that without you. So I'd like to invite all of you to join us in the conversation on the public discussion platform after this event uh, and, and tell us how you see yourself in the WPSAHA compact. The link to the public discussion We're going to start things off today with two pre-recorded videos, which we'll share back to back now. The first from Ina Eriksson uh, Sereda, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Norway, which is a Compact Board member. And the second from Nuzine Mustafa, a young woman peace builder from Syria. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. 20 years after the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, some real progress has been made. Almost 100 national action plans for women, peace and security have been launched. Over the past 15 years, the share of peace agreements, including references to women's rights, has increased from 14 to 22 percent. Still, we are far from where we need to be. Women play key roles in conflict-ridden societies as breadwinners and community leaders, as first responders and mediators. But women are also combatants and ideologists. And yet women remain underrepresented in peace and security efforts. And women peace builders and human rights defenders are increasingly exposed to threats. The global commitment to the women peace and security agenda is substantial and it's growing. There are champions on every continent and our common goal must be to ensure that the commitments made in statements and resolutions are reflected in changed realities on the ground and to find the most effective ways of removing the obstacles to women's equal representation. That is what the Compact for Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action sets out to do. By bringing together the UN and regional organizations, states, civil society, youth and academia, and focusing on implementation of already existing commitments, the Compact can provide us with the organization and the plan we need to make progress. Progress that will translate into real and lasting change on the ground. With the right organization, and a good plan in place. The key to success is dedication. It is, an, as an elected member of the Security Council for the next two years, our duty to have women, peace and security as one of Norway's key priorities. And I can assure you that we will work hard and I know that so will you. We must be concrete and practical. We as member states, the UN and regional organizations, and we must partner with civil society and academia. I look forward to hearing your recommendations on how the Compact can contribute to accelerating the implementation of global commitments to women, peace and security. Because women are not observers of conflict and should not be mere observers of conflict resolution. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm from Syria and I had to leave uh, my country at the age of 14 because of the conflict there. And actually on the way to the, uh, to the, to, uh, the border to safety, um, I was met by some ISIS fighters, ISIS soldiers, and my brother had to lie and tell them that I was still a child and didn't have to cover my head. So that, that made me think of all the women that were left behind under, uh, and that were under such, such oppressive regimes, such oppressive control of a radical group that saw, saw women as, an, as inferior and didn't see, uh, see their worth or value. And I thought, of all the disadvantages, of all the dangers that women are in, um, in, in, in conflicts and, uh, and in wars, because a woman cannot, cannot really go down the street when there, are, uh, there, there, is, there are fights and clashes. A woman um, cannot safely pro uh, uh, go look for, um, uh, go look for means to provide uh, to provide for her for herself and her family sometimes due to poverty and the lack of the lack of resources and the collapse of the economy they are forced to to beg um, in order to provide them for themselves uh, the inclusion of women and you know and the prevention and uh, of a humanitarian crisis is important because they are one group that is disproportionately negatively impacted by these crises. Women are 
um, are often used as tools um, in conflicts. So they and they are often at, um, at risk of facing things like sexual violence or even human trafficking. Different opposing opposing sides sides of wars use women as shields and you use them use dominance over women to demonstrate power. So, so their inclusion in in crisis management and the decision and peacemaking processes is so vital because they they. They are over, they are often they often fall victims to these conflicts, and you can't, and you simply can't solve a problem with half of the society absent from the decision table. The importance of the compact lies in the fact that it um, states in plain and simple term the steps that the steps and measures that should be taken to, in order to but, um, secure, uh, secure the safety and, and peace for women. And they, are, they, they, um, they operate as a kind of guide um, to all, of, all, um, all, all the institutions that have a desire to take action in regard to that, to, the, to this topic. And we are just coming off of those videos and that second one might have been cut very slightly short, but that uh, some very powerful points there we've heard from Ina that women are not observers of conflict and we know this we've known this for a very long time, but the conflicts going on right now around the world in particular and particularly in Syria have displayed this point even more so and powerful witness accounts of that by Nujim there that women are not only not simply observers of war but they are disproportionately negatively impacted and as she has reminded us we cannot solve conflict without half of the population at least being represented uh, in in peace processes <clears throat> So we're going to uh, now I'd like to turn things over to uh, Harriet Williams Wright, a policy specialist with UN Women. She's going to walk us through in very simple terms just what the compact is striving to achieve. And now I'll just hand right over to you, Harriet. Thanks uh, very much, Jane, for that introduction. I will go over very briefly um, on what the compact sets out to achieve in the next five years. So um, the compact will um, focus um, on the implementation of existing commitments of women, peace and security, and also on humanitarian action. It seeks to drive a global movement for action on the implementation of these commitments. And it seeks to do that by three particular ways. One is establishing a voluntary monitoring and accountability process to realize these commitments. A second one is through coordination of the existing mechanisms that we have, the networks that we currently um, engage with and the partnerships and capacities that exist on women, peace and security and humanitarian action. And the third part is that um, the compact will raise awareness and visibility of the women, peace and security agenda and also on humanitarian action, particularly at a time when we're experiencing a pushback against women's human rights and also the rights of women in conflict and crisis situations. A critical focus for the compact will be on the integration of the peace, humanitarian and development nexus. And this is one of the key things that sets the compact apart, that um, for um, um, a very intentional way of bringing these three areas together and looking at the interconnection between peace, humanitarian and development. And very particularly important for the compact is addressing the challenges 
end the rights of young women, indigenous and minority groups, persons with disabilities, LGBTQI, and the specific circumstances of forcibly displaced women and girls. Over the past um, few months, the compact has been addressing these issues across five thematic priorities. One is on financing the WPS agenda and gender equality in humanitarian programming. The second part is on women's meaningful participation in peace processes. The third is on women's economic security, access to resources and other essential services. A fourth thematic priority is women's leadership and agency across peace, security and humanitarian sectors. And the fifth is on the protection of women in conflict and crisis contexts, including women human rights defenders. And the aim of this is not to look at all these issues in silos, but to ensure that we see the interconnection and synergy between all of these five thematic priorities. And really this wouldn't have happened without the board members and the catalytic members who have been involved in this process thus far in developing the compact. And we currently have 35 board and catalytic members and board members will be driving um, this process, will be making um, some very key decisions around actions um, that we will be um, taking forward in the next five years. And catalytic members will also be drawing on their expertise to ensure that um, we have a very robust and comprehensive compact and that we meet the implementation um, guidelines that we want to achieve in the next five years. Thank you, Harriet, that it, it is an ambitious program, but it's probably never been more urgent when we look at conflicts right now and how women have been impacted uh, by them. And now that we've had an overview of the compact, I want to get to the discussion where we can dive deeper into different areas dive deeper into different key areas that the compact will be working on. And to do that, I want to first introduce our panel of discussants today, all of who represent entities that are members of the compact, and then dive into our first questions. Uh, first, discussing women's meaningful participation in peace processes is Hibak Oshman, uh, founder and CEO of Karama, Compact Catalytic member. Joining us today to discuss women's economic security, access to resources and other essential services is Zahra Veneuve, steering committee member, Feminist Humanitarian Network, program director, Freedom from Violence at Global Fund for Women, Feminist Humanitarian Net Network and compact board member as well. Next, focusing on women's leadership and agency across peace, security, and humanitarian sectors is Sharon bagwan Rolls, chair, chair of the board and regional representative of the Pacific Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict and a Compact Catalyt Catalytic member. Joining in conflict and crisis contexts, including women human rights defenders, is Eleanor McNamee, co-founder of Our Generation for Inclusive Peace and Youth Representative uh, and, and, and Youth Representative. Finally, here to tell us about financing for the WS, WPS agenda and gender equality in humanitarian programming is Mavic Cabrera Beleza, founder and CEO of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. So thank you all for being here. Today's discussion will be shaped around a series of questions to the panelists. And we will also do our best, best to ask as many of your questions as we can to the panelists throughout and to keep further time for questions at the end. To that end, I will remind our panelists to keep to the one minute time limit for your responses to this first question that I'll put to you all. <clears throat> so question number one uh, to Hibak Oshman. How would you explain what women's meaningful participation in peace processes is, is how, it, how it is important and what it means in just a tweet? Do we have Hibak? Oh, I think you're muted. 
Okay, um, I'm, I, I agree with both the former speakers, uh, Minister Erickson and Najib Mustafa. To build true lasting peace is something you need the whole community. You can't exclude half the people, expect peace to, uh, peace to just or resilient. It is not simply about women being at the negotiating table, though that remains one of the biggest barriers, but we need to see the women's agenda on the table. Excellent, thank you, thank you so much. That was very clear. Um, and now question two goes to uh, uh, Sharon, Sharon bagwell Rolls. <laughs> And my question for you is, how would you explain what women's leadership and agency across peace, security, and humanitarian sectors means in a tweet? So for me, it's about accountability to gender equality and women's rights, which means resourcing diverse women's participation from the mat to the policy level, because women-led prevention and protection results in inclusive, sustainable peace and transformative humanitarian action. So hashtag redesign the table, hashtag triple nexus, hashtag shift the power. Fantastic, definitely. Long lasting, uh, uh, enduring peace uh, with women at the table and not just there, but leading uh, the, the, the processes. Thank you so much. Uh, question three to Eleanor McNamee. If you only had one tweet, how would you explain what protection of women in conflict and crisis contexts, including women's human rights defenders, is? Uh, how important is that, and what does it really mean? Well, that's a lot for one context, including uh, those human human rights defenders. Sorry, I think I cut you off at the end there. It's, it's a lot to unpack, but if I had one tweet, very simply, um, peace, security, and, and catalytic change can only happen when women girls and gender non-conforming folks are free from violence. Very, very good points there that really add to our discussion. There's a lot more, I'm sure we'll on that. In just one tweet, how would you explain to the world what women's economic security, access to resources and other essential services means? Thank you, Jane. So in a tweet, I would say that women's economic security is the difference between life and death, between leaving a violent context or being forced to stay, between being at the helm and living a life that is centered around our rights or watch as others continue to make things worse. It means justice. It means hashtag nothing less than what's owed. Cabrera Beleza, can you explain to the audience what we mean when we talk about financing the WPS agenda and gender equality in humanitarian <laughs> programming and why is this important in just one tweet? That might be the toughest one yet. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. I don't know what time it is for most of our audience members, but it's 11 in the evening here in New York and nothing wakes me up more than talking about money. So this is a great question and I would request that I can tweet twice. So in 2019, governments around the world spent 1.9 trillion for their military, the biggest annual spending in a decade. So imagine how many more fighter jets, how much more guns, bombs and bullets were bought with that money. How will this massive amount of weapons affect the lives of at least 2 billion people already living in communities affected by war and crisis. Meanwhile, there are many women and young people around the world, especially in local communities, who are working very hard to prevent war, to stop the violence, to build peace, and to ensure that the needs of women and girls in humanitarian emergencies are met. And how much do governments allocate to support their work? Point two percent of total bilateral aid of 96 million. That's only about $192,000 for all of their work around the world. Think about that. Think about the difference between military spending and women's peace building work. This is what we mean when we talk about financing for the women, peace and security and gender equality in humanitarian programming. 
Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for keeping those so brief and succinct and, and, and just, but they still bring a lot uh, to, to the table here and give us so much to discuss going forward in this, in this uh, session. So I'm going to go on to round two now. For the second round, <clears throat> this time around, we have the same question for all of you. Um, the WPSHA Compact is setting out an ambitious five-year timeline for the world to address these critical issues mentioned earlier. From your perspectives, what do you think are some of the key priority actions the Compact should take, uh, should take in, in the next five years? And what is needed for that to happen? So the first, the first person we're going to come to will be Mavic Cabrera Beleza. So we're going to pick up from 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 Mavic again. I'll just repeat that question one more time. <clears throat> from your perspective, what do you think are some of the key priority actions the compact should take in the next five years, and what is needed to make that happen? I would like to propose three priorities for action for the next five years that the compact should focus on. The first one invest on women-led and youth-led organizations through long-term financing for their general, general operations, including through existing funding mechanisms such as the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund. It is very important to give them predictable and long-term support so they are able to focus on their core missions instead of operating on a project-to-project -project basis and are always worried where to get their next funding. Women's leadership is also hampered by this lack of access to sustainable funding because they are not able to dedicate time and energy to continuously build their staff and organizational capacities. I must also emphasize that this priority is in line with one of the goals presented by the UN Secretary General last year during the 20th anniversary of this groundbreaking international law, the UN Security Council Resolution on 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. The goal is to ensure a five-fold increase in direct funding assistance to women's organizations that operate in countries and communities affected by conflicts and crisis. The second action would be to support local women and youth to lead humanitarian work in their communities. I would like to make an appeal to the donor community to fund local women and youth organizations work in humanitarian emergencies. We have seen how effective they are during this pandemic, didn't we? They are distributing food and other relief goods, face masks, disinfectants, including hygiene products such as sanitary pads. And this is not always included in relief packs, by the way. So the local women and youth organizations are the frontliners. They were out there before the big international organizations and they are on the ground disseminating factual information in local languages on how to prevent the spread of the virus when governments still did not know what to do or they were caught in their politicking. Local women and youth face a double whammy of the pandemic and war. So it is in their DNA to quickly and effectively respond to such crises and conflicts. But unfortunately, majority of funding for humanitarian action is accessible only to a handful of large organizations. And it is nearly impossible for local women and youth peace builders to access it. And it's no wonder that too few humanitarian operations fully recognize the specific needs of women and girls. The third action point that I would like to propose is to finance national action plans on women, peace, and security. What are national action plans or NAPs? National action plans are very important instruments by which governments can translate words to actions on the women, peace, and security agenda. It's great to know, as mentioned by Minister Zoraida, that there are close to 100 national action plans now. But the problem is only a quarter of these national action plans have dedicated funding during their adoption. A national action plan without funding is like a car without fuel. It will not take us anywhere. But very quickly, how can these actions happen? Member states and the UN should support civil society so they can participate in donor conferences and speak about their priorities. 
this is this kind of information is often not shared with civil society as if the UN governments and donors belong to an exclusive club. Hey, we are important stakeholders. Civil society have kept the resolutions on women, peace and security alive in the last 20 years. So that has to be recognized and valued and supported. The second um, um, uh, point by which those uh, priorities can happen is to channel at least 5% of the huge military funding to women and youth peace building and humanitarian work. The third is to build political will among member states to adopt dedicated budgets and funding mechanisms for the national action plans. Lastly, and this is on to us, civil society, international organizations like the Global Network of Women Peace Builders should partner with local women's organizations and assist them to build their capacity to participate in women, peace and security and humanitarian action processes and help them become eligible to receive and manage donor funding. And by the way, I should emphasize, many of us are already doing that and it has to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mavic. Those are such important points, especially talking about the grassroots women's organizations. We see them every day, and I, I'm fortunate enough to see them in my work everywhere, making a real difference on the ground. An important point as well that you point out about military funding, that 5% at least could, could, could go towards, towards these kinds of actions. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Next, returning to Zara Vanuve, same question, which I'll just uh, repeat quickly. From your perspectives, Zahra, what do you think are some of the key priority actions the compact should take in the next five years? And what do you think needs to happen for it to, 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 to be successful? Thank you, Jane. So one of the hats that I'm wearing today is that of the Feminist Humanitarian Network or FHN, which is a global network of women leaders who are working together to transform the humanitarian system into one that is guided by feminist principles. And we're comprised of and led by 70% women's rights organizations on the front lines of humanitarian action in the global south. FHN is currently wrapping up across regional research um, that aims at capturing a snapshot of the COVID-19 responses led by women human rights groups as a global example of how the humanitarian system functions from a feminist perspective. This research was led by the FHN's members in the global south who documented their own experiences and achievements during the crisis. The report will be launched soon, so stay tuned. But I wanted to address the question of economic security and access to critical services with a focus on COVID-19 as a crisis that is on all of our minds. FHN members in all regions spoke of the extreme poverty and loss of livelihoods, which has disproportionately been experienced by women and marginalized communities. We heard how households have not been able to afford necessities, including food, how child early forced marriage has increased dramatically as a result of the loss of any semblance of economic security for many households. In Bangladesh, where 91.8% of women are employed in the informal sector, the livelihoods of women have been significantly impacted. Domestic workers, daily laborers, street vendors, cleaners, sex workers, women migrant workers, and other informal workers lost their means to earn an income. And despite operating in the harshest and most unjust of contexts, women human rights groups have accomplished nothing short of miracles during this time. They have had to set up to step up to ensure that critical services that have been closed or made less accessible during lockdowns were still accessible to women. So for example, one of our member in Liberia provided zero interest loans for women affected by the economic impacts of COVID-19. In Lebanon, rather than requiring medical patients and pregnant women to visit health centers for checkups, local <coughs> NGOs have organized safe home visits. These examples um, are just a few and there are so many more, and, but we will need much more time to relay them to you. In many instances, women's organizations provided economic support and access to critical services to women with funding from their own pockets. So leaders, staff, board members have, front, have been giving and fronting funding from their personal finances. 
And so it's then impossible to reconcile all of this we know that women do with the fact that less than 0.1% of COVID-19 funding is being channeled to local civil society. Can you even imagine what the share of women human rights groups is from this 0.1% that has been channeled to local civil society? And this is what we've heard and continue to hear from our grantee partners at Global Fund for Women, the other hat that I'm wearing today. And as a feminist fund that supports gender justice activists around the world, in order for them to lead their own responses, we have heard and continue to hear about how our grantee partners are responding and adapting to the current moment. And we are incredibly inspired by the work that they're doing. We, uh, we're more than committed, uh, we're more committed than ever to our model of feminist, flexible, multi-year funding and have encouraged our partners to use our support in whatever way they feel is best for their communities. And so what we need is simple. We need for women to play central roles in designing humanitarian response schemes. We need donors and national and local governments to ensure funding for services that protect women's rights. And that these are not diverted in times of crisis as we've seen over and over again. And we need more than language around including women or encouraging this or supporting that. We need the compact to entrench a new way of working, a way of working that follows the leadership of women working at grassroots and local levels on the front lines of humanitarian response, women who are creating and managing effective solutions to challenge. We need concrete and bold commitments. We need accountability. And we need gender justice to be more than a pie in the sky, as Dr. Anusanti Pillai, my dearest colleague, and fellow steering committee member at um, FHN says, indeed, we do need gender justice to be more than a pie in the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Zahra. Such an important point, discussing the, 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 at this point with COVID and the lockdowns and the impact on, uh, on women globally. I think that the, uh, the examples you give from Lebanon and Liberia of women reaching out to help one another and feminist humanitarians' actions are, are incredibly helpful for for us to be able to see what it is that, that you're talking about. And the, the funding issues are, are quite depressing and certainly an important part of, of what, uh, what you're all trying to sort of solve here in, in, in this compact. So thank you so much. Um, moving on to Eleanor McNamee. Um, I, again, I'm just gonna ask uh, from your perspective, Eleanor, what do you think are the key priority actions for the compact and what is needed for it to happen? Thanks so much, Jane. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. All the ideas that are coming out already are fantastic, and I see so many connections between all of our lines of effort. So it's, it's hard to, to have siloed conversations, but I'll do my best to, to touch on the protection of women in, in conflict and crisis contexts, including human rights defenders. Um, and protection is, is a really important issue, but I'm going to try and break it down in, in three, three or four points. Um, and the first, is that protection is really the most fundamental element that we need for gender equality work. All of the other actions in this compact can only happen when women and girls and gender non-conforming folks are, are free from violence. It's, it's really that simple. If you want women in peace processes, they need to be safe. If you want women in leadership positions, they need to be safe. And I, I think something we need to be cognizant of is that gendered violence exists everywhere. Um, so even though we're talking about crisis or conflict situations, if women aren't safe in times of peace, they, they certainly won't be safe in times of crisis. So the protection work of this compact over the next five years, I think, should really be focusing on addressing the root causes of gendered violence, which are really patriarchy and, and misogyny. Um, the second point I'll make about protection is that uh, protection is not an invitation for paternalism. And um, I'll, I'll break that down a little bit because it's, it's a bit wordy, but I'm sure lots of folks on this call today uh, tuned in and also the panelists are familiar with the fact that in situations of conflict and crisis, when, when every issue seems to be urgent, one of the most troubling things uh, that I've seen um, 
how protection has been mobilized is when it's used as a justification for exclusion. So, you know, this peace talk isn't safe, so women can't be at the table. And this is absolutely the wrong approach to protection. And I think it's something that this compact is really trying to work through and reshape the narrative around. And one of the best ways that we can do this is by focusing on agency, because really protection without agency is at the end of the day, paternalism. And the way that we do this is to look to women as experts on their own lives. If you want to protect women, you need to listen to their needs and be willing to let their words shape your actions. The third point I'll make is that, um, and this is probably the most important one, is that protection looks very different to different people based on their intersecting identities. Um, so our protection work is this compact you know, there's a bit of a tension I see here and I'll, I'll try to work through it. Um, you know, it needs to be contextualized to the lived experiences of individuals, but at the same time, it needs to be very macro large looking because we need to be addressing the systemic nature of gendered barriers and, and violence. And, you know, I know this is a big ask. Um, it requires a lot of work, uh, but if we don't do it, we, we really won't be effective. If we're just going to protect a very small margin of people who need protection in crisis and conflict situations. Uh, you know, LGBTQ folks or gender non-conforming folks will face very different forms of violence than straight cisgendered women, and racialized women will face very different forms of violence than white women. And if we don't address that nuance, our protection work is, is not going to be effective. So I think over the next five years, one of the most critical things that this compact needs to do is to really apply an intersectional lens to our work. In a consistent manner and not as an afterthought. Um, I, I, I see this work starting to happen with the compact already and my hope is that over the next five years we, we really dig deep and we learn how to do this work well. Um, and finally, I am here today um, as the youth rep and representing a youth organization I co-founded which is Our Generation for Inclusive Peace. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't address the fact that uh, young people need to be at the table um, for the work of the compact to be successful. Um, and just, you know, just as an anecdote, when this, when this compact first started, the organizers recognized very quickly that the youth representation in this compact wasn't sufficient. And I commend the organizers uh, because they worked really quickly to recognize and fix the problem. Um, but I think it's important to raise an example because it's indicative of a much larger trend that's happening. And it's that young people are being consistently left out. And when we are included, it's often as an afterthought, not in the early stages, meaning that we're not involved in the foundational or formative discussions of these pro processes and mechanisms. You know, true gender equality is not gonna happen in one generation. Um, I was very young when 1325 was passed. It, I was in grade school, it wasn't even on my radar. And I'm here today because of the work that came before me, largely by people on this call. And this work is gonna continue once I'm done. And, you know, this matters not just because feminists believe, you know, as feminists, we believe that inclusion should be integral to everything we do. But on a very practical level, if you want your work to be successful and have long lasting impact, especially the work on this compact, you need us. You need us at the table because we are the ones who are going to be inheriting your work, um, you know, in future years. And and just on that point, um, you know, we often talk about young people in a future tense, you know, the leaders of tomorrow, next generation, young people are already here, we are mobilizing, we are doing this work, and um, all we need, all we need is an invitation to your table. So I will leave it there, but um, I'm sure we'll bring out some lovely more nuance on this topic, uh, more in the Q&A later. Thanks so much, Jane. Right, highlight at the end. I have jotted just now. Protect, um, uh, you know, the, the protect danger. Exclusion of women. This is such an important point. Uh, we've seen. Well, uh, areas where, where we, I, I,
sorry, I was just, sorry, uh, El, <laughs> sorry, I was just, just the internet just dropped out on me there, Eleanor, as I was, as I was just com complimenting you and your comments. Um, uh, anyway, you also mentioned quite extensively the need for young people to be more at the forefront of all of these processes. And we're all listening very carefully. I think that's an incredibly important point and will be relevant for now and forever. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just pick up from here and move on to Hibak Osman. So Hibak, for you, what do you think are some of the key priority actions for the compact that needs to be taken in the next five years and, and what, needs to what needs to happen to make it uh, a success? I think it's very welcome that the compact recognizes the work to increase women's meaningful participation in peace it needs to take place at the many levels simultaneously, not just one part. Whether we are working as a civil society in government, international and regional organizations, the private sector, academia, we all have not just the role, but the responsibility to, to peace and to women's participation. It has been very gratifying for me to see the discussion around what civil society can do, complementing what so many women-led organizations have already been doing. This is not something new. Women have already been doing this. We have long been working to find the women who have put the work into building constituency and their credibility to lead and supporting them so that they are able to have an impact on these processes. In the work of Kramo over the last uh, 16 years, it has been an incredible honor to do what we can to support the emergency of uh, the emergence of some of the truly remarkable women leaders. Uh, who, for example, we have uh, worked and supported Sarah Langby, who is the co-founder of the Libya Platform for Peace through the most extraordinary difficult circumstance. Zahra has preserved and, sh uh, preserved and shown uh, this year, it was Sarah's and the Libyan Platform for Peace who blew the whistle on corruption in the Libyan political forum. We have worked closely with Muna Qanim, who served as a member of the Women's Advisory Board to the United Nations Special Envoy to Syria, and who has been forthright in saying that such mechanisms are not meaningful forms of participation. And instead, Muna has been doing truly remarkable work to develop a way forward on Syria, building a constituency across the complex Syrian demographic spectrum. For one day, you know, from day one, it has been my pleasure to work with Samuel Hashimi, a brilliant lawyer and legal expert. Under the previous regime in Sudan, Samia and women like her were kept well away from decision-making positions, but the opportunity provided by the transition now sees her appointed uh, uh, by the Minister of, uh, of Justice um, to lead fight a legal reform. It's such an amazing honor to work with Susan Ari, for example, who is in a, who has done in Iraq, with the Arab Women's Organization, who has done such brilliant work to make women peace and security a reality in Iraq. Her work leading the cross-sector task force shown a path for compact to how different parts of society can work together. Amal Basha, who played a vital role in Yemen national dialogue to secure guarantees on women's participation in government. Amal has been a key voice in the rights of Yemen and last year led work to coordinate truly remarkable report to the UN on the situation of women and girls in Yemen. These are activities who again and again, these are activists who again and again have proven the impact of women's meaningful uh, uh, participation in peace. But by definition, a movement cannot stand still. It has to be renewed. And the compact recognizes, and this is where the important importance of the compact is, compact recognizes that movements must be durable and inclusive. We must look beyond the cities across demographics to be truly representative. And we as Karama are doing more than more on this. We have been working to build the skills of the next generation of leaders, expanding our network, understanding the priorities of the people doing the work on the ground. We have been doing what we can to support and prepare women to participate effectively in peace and to work with them as they carve out opportunities to make a difference. 
What has been so important about the work of the compact, and I do want to thank and recognize the work that colleagues at the UN Women have done, is to bring this work together across sectors so we can coordinate on the bigger picture. Because for all that we have been doing as civil society, there are factors of such a scale that we will struggle to challenge them on our own. Ultimately, there is nothing more effective at excluding women than the militarization of politics. It is a simple equation. If you are spending money on military solutions, you are tipping the balance against inclusive political solution to conflict. Our working group has talked about international governments using the means available to them to provide incentives and exert pressure in conflict situation to advance women's participation. This is something that can make a huge difference. Let me tell you, there is no better way to incentivize or impose pressure on conflict actors to get around the table and ensure women's representation than by cutting off the, uh, uh, the army supply, supply of arms. It is going to be easy to see the commitment of member states, uh, states to, to the work of this compact over the next five years, purely in budgetary terms. If a government is paying lip service to women's participation while picking up the tab for the very guns that are barring women from the negotiating table, we will know about their real commitment to the compact and to peace at large. You can appoint as many women envoys and provide as much training by the greatest institutions possible. But if at the same time, you are going to continue fueling conflict, arming your preferred factions, you will be undermining that woman envoy and no woman will be participating in any meaningful sense. So it's a reality check. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Habak. Such important points there. Brilliant organizations are already doing brilliant work, but these points about, about the militarization uh, of politics, that nothing is more effective at excluding women than the militarization of politics. That's such an important point. And those who are dedicated to a military solution and, and how that pushes women out uh, of, of peace processes. And, and, and the importance of cutting off the supply of arms. Thank you so much for such important points. And um, now, finally, we'll move on to Sharon Bagwan Rolls. So, Sharon, just for you, I'm just going to repeat the question one last time. Um, from your perspective, what do you think are the key priority actions for the compact to take in the next five years? And what is needed for it to happen? Um, thanks so much, Jane. Um, you know, I, I have to start by saying I woke up this morning. Uh, to the news that the government of Australia has a $1 billion federal plan to build a new weapons facility with a global arm manufacturer um, in preparation for greater tensions in the region. And it really made me think that, um, as Mavic pointed out earlier, where's the money then for, you know, real deep grassroots prevention work um, that we have been talking about through the WPS agenda. Um, this is going to take place in the big backyard of our Pacific Islands. Um, governments, our Pacific governments who have made a commitment to, you know, nuclear free Pacific um, and um, a commitment that Pacific Forum leaders have also made to a human security approach when addressing regional security. So, so I think now more than ever, what does it mean when we talk about women's leadership and agency? It means bringing that women's rights and feminist agenda into these very conversations. We're not a separate conversation. Um, and so it means, once again, investment in our leadership and agency, not building militarized systems. It's investing in women of all diversities in our different leadership roles, in dialogue and mediation, inclusive community-led processes, and analyzing the drivers and indicators of conflict. It means investing in preparedness and prevention as an ongoing investment that shifts the power from those that think that militarization and military capabilities will build um, peaceful societies, or it's the easy approach in terms of humanitarian response, um, rather than really understanding the implications for having security sector in some of these very fragile situations. 
So we also need to address then in the current context, what are the social, economic, and political barriers to participation? And for us in the Pacific, we've been asking women and young women, particularly about um, following recent recurrent national disasters that is resulting in forced displacement and this scramble for things like water um, and, and um, you know, what does that mean when you're a girl or a woman and you just don't have access to water? And what we're starting to hear is it's leading to community tensions, which can escalate into major conflicts. Now, these are the very um, these are the very examples. These documented examples need to be brought to the table, whether it's a protection cluster meeting or national human security assessment meetings. So, what we have been looking at as GPAC um, at the global level, but as it's very much connected to the work that's happening at the national and regional level, is recognizing what women's leadership means as part of peace building and in collaboration here in the Pacific with our Shifting the Power Coalition. Le women's leadership offers that unique entry point into communities, into local communities. Um, we bring a very specific type of expertise that, as someone said earlier, if young women aren't there, if women with disabilities aren't there, if we're not there in all our diversities, you're missing a whole chunk of the population. And we're able to look at the analysis around current situations, whether it's conflict or humanitarian crises, including climate change um, induced disasters, to be able to think about what is the response, not just for tomorrow, but in a sustainable way. It, it's really important that um, as the uh, Generation Equality Forum process has brought about this multi-stakeholder process, women's leadership and agency needs to be there as well, because it's there, it's been here where we've been able to have this conversation in the establishment of this compact between member state civil society, um, which includes young women as well as myself and, and UN and other agencies. And I think last but not least, we're able to look at this interconnection um, or the nexus approach that isn't new. It's, it's not something that we just thought about overnight, but it's part of our lived reality, which is why back in 2015, you know, we lobbied um, UN Women and they advocated for us to be able to get two words into UN Security Council Resolution 2242, and that was climate change. And if you look at that resolution in that year, it reflects women's leadership in a time when women were responding to a health pandemic on the African continent, and we were talking about the climate change issues um, in our Pacific region. I think there are a couple of other things that I just need to um, amplify as well. Resourcing, like Mavic has said, is just critical. We have seen time and time again when women's initiatives are not being resourced. And as Zara says, um, Global Fund for Women and Women's Funds have you know, decades of, of work to, to show how funds can be organized to reach women on the ground. And we're not gonna get women's leadership and agency in those spaces of decision-making if the resources aren't there in the processes that we want to be able to use to then determine what are the decisions that need to be made. It's that consultative process that we bring through our feminist practice. It's also listening and seeing how we ourselves in our own local, national and regional coalitions are also organizing. And this is one of the ways how GPAC in the Pacific region through the Shifting the Power Coalition has been able to get resources to the to women on the ground in response to COVID, as well as devastating cyclones as well. We definitely don't need new commitments. We've just come out of CSW. There's been a lot of talk around women's uh, leadership and representation. We hear about quotas, et cetera. But what we need, I think, is the approach to localization. And I don't just mean women getting elected into local government or local councils. So we need to look at women's leadership and agency from the perspective of the movement um, and being in a space where we can start to unpack and address and address the systems where the work is getting done on the ground, where the women are in terms of their doorstep. 
Um, and within this as well, I mean, there are now new guidelines for young people in humanitarian action. How do we also support young women to be part of those conversations where all our governments have made commitments, whether it's the WPS resolutions, whether it's the grand bargain, or whether it's the Sendai framework? Accountability at the end of the day is, is key. And, and so for me, um, as I've been saying, you know, the accountability process, um, which to a multi-stakeholder process is going to be critical in realizing these commitments, in realizing these ambitions of, of the compact. Because if we've been able to demonstrate it um, at a global level that this is possible with the kind of structure that we have in the compact with the board, with the catalytic members, with the diversity of representation, then what we need to do is have that accountability, accountability system at the regional level, at the national level, linked to the local systems and structures of our different countries um, and, and making sure that we don't just have lovely political will type statements, but really this institutionalization of accountability and that makes the linkages with human rights treaty commitments such as CEDAW, such as the UPR. So I think at the end of the day, we just need to make sure that those standards, those commitments, the resources and, and the approaches that best fit the needs of women in the different roles that they play in their communities, but also in, in supporting women's leadership to be in the different spaces uh, are well, um, not just acknowledged, but resource supported and um, organized in a way that it's intergenerational and diverse as well. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks so much. Such important points there about institutionalization of accountability and actually following up uh, on, on action. And, and I didn't actually, I hadn't heard in the news about that, 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 that story from Australia, but I'll be sure to look it up after this. That's, that's interesting. And, um, and you, you, you quite rightly make the point that a billion dollars has been budgeted for weapons manufacturing, but, um, but that segues very well into what's being discussed here about funding for, for women in, in conflict. So thank you so much. And so now we'd like to invite our audience to join the discussion. Uh, you can use the chat feature to ask a question in your language, but please indicate what, uh, who your question is directed to um, so I can ask them directly. So I'm just gonna come to some of the questions that we've already had in. Um, actually, the first one is for you, Sharon. Um, so we're gonna pick up uh, again with you if that's okay. Um, and then anybody else who wants to contribute. But do you think the dialogue for integrating gender into peace negotiations and humanitarian planning has changed over recent years? Has there been any sign of improvement? And if so, how can we build on that? Um, thanks for the question. I think, um, I mean, peace building and humanitarian, it, it is, I, I, you know, this is one of the first times where we're actually, as Harriet said from the outset, we're really driving this triple nexus approach, the peace development and humanitarian nexus. I think about two years ago when I talked about it, someone from one of the UN agencies was like, no, this can't happen. So um, I think that the dialogue, the, the small pockets of dialogue have started in many different places, but what we're hoping to see in the Pacific, if I can use that example, is a space where we are able to bring together and support women's leadership to be part of the peace building dialogue, the humanitarian dialogue, as well as the, the climate change dialogue as well, because there are those interlinkages, but there's very, um, but there's a need to really support um, and understand the, the interconnection. Um, the dialogue story I'd like to share is how in Bougainville last year, um, one of our peace builders, um, Agnes Titus, she's one of the women who brokered um, peace um, after the war, well, brought an end to the war in Bougainville, took her work on women, peace and security, sat down with the Bougainville Disaster Management Committee, looked around and noticed that there were no women at the table. And she said, look, this is an issue right now that is affecting all of us. We need women at this table. This is a disaster management committee and there are no women. And they were able to immediately get two seats at the table. So I think that 
those are the kinds of local dialogue and actions that are taking place. But it does need the support of feminist coalitions and networks like we're all working at in our different regions to be able to really support and, and bring visibility to that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Aaron. If anybody else wants to your specific question, please feel free to. Um, otherwise, I will move on to a question from Mavic, actually, um, uh, and also whoever wants to contribute to this one as well. So it's, it's more open. If we're promoting direct funding to local level women's organizations, what measures should be taken to facilitate this and to address barriers to much needed support? What standard should be used to select local women's organizations, to select the organizations themselves? So I'll just repeat that one for, for you, Mavic. If, if we're promoting direct funding to local level women's organizations, what measures should be taken to facilitate this and address barriers to much needed support? What standards should be used to select those organizations? Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's from Xiaowa Wang. Um, let me share with you the, um, the approach that the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund is using. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder funding mechanism dedicated to supporting local women's rights organizations that operate in communities affected by conflict and crisis. So um, I'm one of the two civil society initiators of this fund. And when we, yeah, we lobbied for it uh, for six years before it took off the ground. And one, there, there were two conditions that we set uh, when we established it, that the funding is dedicated to local women's rights organizations. And then the second is that local women's rights organizations are not just recipient of the fund, but they would have a say in decision-making on how the funds will be allocated. So um, in the structure of the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, uh, um, there are uh, three decision-makers, um, the member states, donor member states, UN entities that have a mandate on implementing women, peace and security agenda and humanitarian action. And uh, third, most importantly, civil society. So we really demanded a seat at the decision-making table on funding and that we will be on equal footing with the two other, um, the, the two other components, meaning the member states and the UN uh, entities. And uh, this doesn't usually happen. You know, we civil society are often included in decision-making structures as token uh, where, you know, um, it's not really on, you know, on, on equal footing, it's, we don't have an equal say. But this has changed with the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund. So there's a, there's a structure at the global level and there's also a structure at the local level. And one of the other important decisions that was made is that the representation of civil society is by self-selection, meaning we were not identified by the government or the UN entities. And as we know, in some countries, there are such organizations that we refer to as GONGO or government organized NGOs that are really often are, are the you know, propaganda, part of the propaganda machinery of uh, governments. Um, so this uh, decision-making structure selects the women's organizations and they have a presence on the ground. As I said, they, there is a corresponding there's a global funding board and there's a national funding board with representation of civil society. So they know who is working on, on women, peace and security issues and they know who is promoting gender equality and humanitarian programming. Um, but I should 
yeah, and part of this is also to support a broad range of women's organizations and civil society groups. I must say it's not, you know, I keep emphasizing women's rights organizations, but we also recognize male gender equality allies and gender non-conforming uh, uh, individuals who have formed their organizations, including uh, LGBTQI um, organizations. And broad range meaning small, medium term, uh, medium scale to slightly big organizations. And the emphasis also is on supporting organizations, not just individuals, so that it, there's organizational strengthening there and there is a general operation support or support for the realization of the core mission. And finally, I just wanted to emphasize when we talk to the donors, we say we need to invest in women's rights organizations. And by investing, we also recognize that there are risks. And often it, the risk is not taken on local women's rights, civil society, and LGBTQI organizations. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Jane, yes, over thank to you. you. I think um, we were going to go. Thank you. I think Sharon was going to jump in here uh, for, for, to, to, to also discuss this topic. Yes, thanks, um, Jane. And just building on from Mavic's point, but also what Sarah pointed out earlier, and maybe Sarah could follow up in terms of the, the feminist funds. Um, but both the Feminist Humanitarian Network and GPAC, for example, are modalities of um, how resources are mobilized to be able to support networks, um, women on the ground doing the kind of activities. And, and this is particularly important in terms of small grant management, but when women know that this is exactly what we need to be able to get X, Y, Z done, um, that's really important. Um, and then there are also like regional mechanisms. Um, and once again, for example, through the Shifting the Power Coalition, it brings together 13 women-led organizations, including our GPAC Pacific Gender Focal Points. And in, um, in the partnership or in, in the coalition is ActionAid Australia. Um, that provides a very important fiduciary role in, in supporting um, not just uh, in, in supporting the financial um, management for the coalition partners. And what that means is the partners have been able to identify the priorities and um, the funds are being able to reach the partners when they need them, whether it's for rapid response or um, supporting them in f bigger fundraising drives as well, such as the current COVID spikes in Papua New Guinea, or in, in developing programs at the localization level. And that's really important because you can spend a lot of time in fundraising and then you can spend a lot of time in reporting and then you're stressed out about the implementation. So I think there are a number of different modalities, Jane, that are in existence simply because um, of the work that you know we've been doing collectively and and recognizing what are those funding modalities we need right now thanks jane thank you so much um so just just moving on to the next question there uh this one is for eleanor um and also anybody else who wants to contribute eleanor how do we ensure that this is a truly intergenerational intersectional process where everyone leads across generations and no one is left behind in practice how does this work can you break it down down for us like in layman's terms how we literally make that happen sure um yeah absolutely and i'll acknowledge i'll start by acknowledging that it will take some some change because it, it's not happening yet and but um we're all on this call here because we believe that that change is important so um uh, but I, you know, co-founding a youth organization and, and working among these amazing um, youth networks that are, are popping up all over the world, um, it's really young people, I find, who are pushing the agenda forward. We're, we're asking for a more intersectional 
you know, agenda. We're asking for a more decolonized agenda. We're asking for, you know, closer connections between the women, peace and security agenda and the youth peace and security agenda. And I think one of the most concrete ways that we can make sure that youth are having a meaningful impact is um, to make sure that we are um, given the space and being allowed to invest in shaping the systems that affect our lives and our future. So uh, on a very practical level, as I said before, don't include us as an afterthought. Make sure we're there from day one and um, be open to our suggestions. Um, you know, just I, I find that a lot of principles that we advocate for for women are directly applicable to to advocating for the inclusion of youth as well and i think we're all familiar with them on this call but but just to break it you know, break a few down very concretely yeah invite us early on make sure we're not an afterthought um you know if you're including us make sure that you're you're willing to um change change what you're doing based on our recommendations don't just include us as um, as a token, just how, you know, often women are tokenized in these in these processes and um, trust that we are, you know, capable of making, you know, um, decisions on an equal playing field to you. Um, even if we haven't been involved in in this space for for decades, we know the future that we want to be building. And I think in, in any sector, I mean, if you look at the climate sector, you know, youth mobilization is happening everywhere. And as I said before, we just need an invitation to the table because we're already doing this work. Um, so yeah, I would, I just to reiterate, I would say a lot of the principles that we advocate for, for women's inclusion are directly applicable to youth inclusion as well. And just to make sure that we are being included early on and making sure that you are open and receptive to our recommendations, um, even if they're they're not the status quo, because we shouldn't be relying on the status quo anymore. That's the whole point of the compact. So um, I'll leave it there, but I would also love to hear the thoughts from the other panelists, because this isn't just on, it's not, it shouldn't be on the burden of, of youth and young people to advocate for an inclusion. So I'd love to hear um, thoughts from the other panelists as well. Thank you, Eleanor. I agree entirely. I think Hibak is going to jump in here, but I'd like to, to encourage everybody else as well to feel free to jump in. And, and, and I mean, these questions are applicable to every. I'll, I'll just jump over to Hibak. Yes. <clears throat> I think it's, um, it's complicated. I don't, in terms, first of all, I would like to go to the, uh, the first question, which was about the funding. There is no equality. We are all saying, well, you know, we have to gender this. You were talking about racism, we are doing this. And when it comes to money, it's all present. Women who are living out of those, you know, cor UN corridors and, you know, who are living, uh, who are closer to donors in terms of proximity and all that, absolutely no prayers to get the funding directly. It's women who are like, you know, who are, who are connected with the organizations on the ground that have they have to still pass through somebody else so money going directly to them like that does not really exist and if it does it's because people like you know Merrick and you know Zahra and others who are conscious of what the reality is on the ground to push for that but when it comes to uh to, when it comes to the standards it's so colonized that somebody needs to break that system and culture into pieces to make it a reality for the woman who are living in other countries to have access to the funds. So instead of saying this is the standard and that, that itself is going to leave behind a lot of women. So we have to, when we look at funding, we have to be very practical. It's the same organizations that are going to get still the funding and still they will be the gatekeepers for other women who are living in other parts. So even though we are all women and we are all talking and you know we, we are all this, no, there is no equality in that. Money facilitates the work that women on the ground are working on. And they are the ones who are fighting ISIS, they are the ones who are fighting war, they are the ones who are fighting child uh, marriage and all of that. So we have to find a way working with them together and supporting their ideas, priorities and agenda. You will not find the woman on the ground talking about intersectionality, transformational, this and that. They don't have that long ago. So we need to be practical, decolonize the culture of funding to make sure that this, that woman, ordinary woman can actually have access to funding. Now, when we talk about the standards, a lot of times those standards leave ordinary women who are doing all the work behind. They don't have the access 
they don't have the lingo and they don't have, uh, you know, uh, 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 what supposedly it takes. So I, I feel like we need to decolonize the funding uh, system and keep an open mind and have and support women directly the best way that we can in where they are and in where they are doing the work. In terms of youth, I think we have, uh, it used to be very rare that people would talk youth in a meaningful way. I think people are very conscious now to say, okay, we need young people and all that. So it's still, we have a long, 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 you know, uh, way to go, but it's, it's in the discussion, it's in the work, and it's very normal to say we need to, uh, to bring in, uh, you know, young people. So uh, again, funding is very complicated, needs to be, I, I cannot repeat enough, needs to be decolonized so that people have equal access to it. Thank you. Thank you, Hibak. That, that very important points. And I see Mavak, I see, I, I'm going to come to Mavak in just a second. I just wanted to ask a very quick follow up on that one. When, when we talk about the standards that, that the local grassroots, local women on the ground sometimes struggle with when it comes to Whenever, uh, when, whenever you you mention decolonizing, can you can you give us some examples like those standards, for instance? What challenges literally face uh, women who maybe have just started up their own local organization or who are just trying to break through and they're dealing with gatekeepers like the bigger organizations? Can you can you put it in layman's terms for 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 the for those listening, like what that might look like for those women? Yes, it looks. Uh, first of all, if a woman. If, uh, for organizations on the ground, it's easy to take a chance with a woman who is very strong, who has trust with her constituency, who has been doing the work. I, I met women who didn't even know they could actually be, their work could be supported. So if the community, uh, if she has constituency, if she, she is trusted in, the, uh, in, in, in her own community, if she's doing the work, I don't need you know, a standard to say, this is how you should write your proposal. This is how you should say, you should have these words in it. I don't have to, because she has already proven and she has credibility with her community. So we have to keep an open mind with that. So uh, uh, when I say we have to decolonize, you cannot ask that woman, okay, where is your strategy plan? A strategy plan for the last five years? I've been living in the Middle East, a strategy plan five years ago, honey, things have changed a long time ago and they change every day. So if you don't, 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 don't hold me to it because life has changed. Again, so that kind of a thing. So we need to, you know, work out of the box if we are very serious, but if we are going to have a checklist because we talked to a donor and the donor said that we need, you know, this, you have to include women's rights and then the environment and tomorrow it's this thing, then we, we are all lost. So uh, that's one. When we talk about gatekeepers, well, the fact of the matter is some people have, I mean, it's, that's it, it's their expertise. You know, you actually hire a fundraiser so that they can write the proposal so they can put this and that. Now, if you look at a woman who's working in Libya and put her in a same standard as someone who is in LA or, uh, you know, wherever they might be in other countries, you know, of course they are not going to be equal. So if the proposal is going to be, um, you know, looked at, the one who has hired someone to write a perfect proposal is going to win. So. Again, when we say decolonizing, we need funders to really know that the women who are on the ground know what they're doing and should be supported and find ways to adjust their thinking into that. Not that woman who is on the ground to adjust herself to somebody in yani, Copenhagen is thinking. So this is what we need. Uh, when I say decolonizing, this is definitely what we read. And, and then all the contradictions, we want to support women, we want to end violence against women, but again, you are putting the block. We need, we need to move the blocks, but you actually are putting the blocks to women who do not have an accessibility. And when it comes to women, uh, you know, we, we, we're all great and wonderful and all that, but also we suffer the same uh, diseases that uh, we are fighting against. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that, that's incredibly helpful, helpful uh, to, to illustrate. Um, to my with, some, with some more uh, comments on these questions. I, I just wanted to go back to the point made by Eleanor on youth participation. And we, we have a Young Women Leaders for Peace program at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. And uh, this actually even came before the uh, development 
or, or adoption of the youth peace and security resolutions by the UN Security Council. Uh, I completely support uh, Eleanor's point about um, demanding member states and, and the UN and other stakeholders to always ensure to invite uh, young people, especially young women, to the discussion and decision-making table. But as we know, this doesn't happen. Uh, and um, it's, you know, exclusion seems to be the rule rather than the exception. And by the way, when, when we speak about youth policies, usually that is equated to young men and not necessarily including young women. So um, our discussion always with the young women leaders for peace that we work with in, in Bangladesh, in Ukraine, in Myanmar, in the Philippines and uh, many other countries is don't wait to be invited. Uh, invite yourselves, assert yourselves. And we've seen that happening already. And uh, I have nothing but respect and admiration for these uh, young leaders in Myanmar we've seen who are the leaders of the uh, uh, civil disobedience after the uh, coup. Uh, it's the young people in the Philippines who have led the, um, the uh, approval of the uh, peace agreement between the government and the more Islamic liberation front. It's the young people. And, and we see that you know, young people are, are leading movements around the world, not just on women, peace and security, uh, but also in, in you know, climate, climate justice, racial justice. So I, I think we, we, you know, we already uh, see young people inviting themselves to the negotiation table or decision-making table, and at the same time, redesigning that table. Um, since I have the microphone, Jane, I wonder if I can respond to Anu's question uh, on whether the compact uh, has teeth to make what needs to happen with financing and funding. Um, the compact will need to have teeth or grow teeth and strong teeth. And with all due respect to the member states and UN entities who are board members and catalytic members of the compact, it will be civil society who will ensure that that will happen, that, the, that, there, that it will have teeth and it will, you know, those are strong feet. It will be us who will insist that the work will be guided by feminist values and humanitarian principles. And I think we are all on the same page uh, that um, we are in the compact not to do business as usual on women, peace and security and humanitarian action, but to push the envelope and to ensure that um, we are not, you know, we are not there just, you know, to form this, you know, another um, clique who are talking about women, peace and security and humanitarian action among ourselves in our uh, echo chamber, but broaden the conversation, broaden participation in decision-making, especially uh, by the people who would benefit the most from the, uh, from, from the policies and actions that um, the compact will make sure to translate from rhetoric to realities. And those are women and young people and uh, LGBTQI individuals, P, uh, women and youth with disabilities, you know, all local populations in their diversities and with young women and uh, women at the core. Thank you, Mavic. Thank you so much. Um, I will just move on to, to, to one other question that we have now um, from, from our audience. This one goes out to all panelists, so anybody can feel free to jump in and, and discuss this, and um, it's, it's a good one. Uh, data and analysis is important for understanding the differing impact of conflict and crisis on women, girls, men, and boys. However, it's not always easily accessible, especially directly from women and girls. What can we do to improve the accessibility and accuracy of data decision-making processes? 
anybody who wants to jump in on this one can. Could I, could I just quickly, um, I, I think yeah. it is technical, um, Jane, but also maybe sometimes when we get so technical, we, we lose sight of what, what, where data and information is available um, at the local level. Um, and this is where, um, you know, we often talk about our traditional governance systems, our faith-based communities as well, um, because they know where the communities are, they know where the people are, they know where populations are moving, um, who has left the village, who has come back. There are systems, particularly here in the Pacific. So I think, you know, we need to look beyond, um, global north kind of um, of of uh, approaches to data and and have the quanti quantifiable information is certainly important but also the qualitative at the end of the day the evidence is not just about the numbers um, it's also about um, the how and the whys as well. So for me, um, yes, data is important. There are many ways to identify data. There are many ways to be able to use um, national data systems to be able to ensure you know, gender inclusion. But at the end of the day, um, we've always said that participation is not just about numbers. It's about the quality of the process as well. Thanks, Jane. That's okay. If I could just follow up on that a little bit. And, and you know, when, when we look at quality, uh, and you're right, like looking at something in a holistic way rather than just the numbers, but Sharon, how would that look? Like if we're, if we're trying to get data that is much more high quality and, 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 and much less broad strokes in terms of big numbers, how does that, how does that work on the ground? What would be the practical steps to implement that? So one of the practical steps um, that we're currently re-looking at in terms of the work that I've done here in the Pacific with um, within our own feminist networks has been to be able to look at um, women's leadership, um, so women's representation, not just as the individual, but also when you set up a database of women leaders, you're actually able to see um, her household numbers, which are not always just the nuclear family, but the extended family as well. And in many of our traditional systems, we also then have our, our village, you know, our, our village identity, our, um, our indigenous identity as well. Then when we look at her leadership positions, getting the women to also talk about um, those spaces where she is bringing her experience from. So you're able to then um, quantify um, how many members in the small club, like, you know, in a faith group, in a, in a, a sewing or a weaving group, and then, of course, the, the different structures that she belongs to. And that is one of the ways that we've actually been able to advocate about women's leadership, because there's often been this whole idea that, um, well, you, you can only be a woman leader if you've been elected. But, oh, my God, you know, how easy is that? Not very. Um, so, you know, being able to present women's leadership as, as saying, you know, this is the community that she brings to the table. Um, and I think similarly with young women, with women with disabilities, this is how you build that constituency. And therefore, it, it's actually also then helping the woman leader to think about now in this situation, on this issue, what are these women you know, a feeling, what are they saying? And, and so that way we're also changing the narrative or, or enhancing the narrative. I hope that clarifies, Jane, thanks. Thank you, yeah, that's helpful, Sharon. Um, I'm just gonna turn to Zahra quickly for a second. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you've mentioned in this session uh, about accountability. And so there's a question that has come through um, about accountability, given all the persistent challenges of implementation of all of these existing commitments, what can the compact do differently to ensure accountability for the women, peace and security and humanitarian action agendas? Thanks, Jane. So in terms of accountability, I think one of the one of the issues we hear all the time that is needed is numbers, right? We need to have clear, uh, clear targets, clear goals, and not ones that are that put us in the safe zone, right? Not ones that 
that we think are easier to achieve. But when we see giving the, 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 the numbers that uh, the, the small numbers of, of per the percentage that is going uh, to fund uh, women human rights organizations, it is important to be bold and to have uh, uh, and to have clear mechanisms in place in terms of then how how do we hold uh, how do we hold each other accountable. It is also important about accountability to ensure that women human rights um, defenders who are leading change, who are uh, who are leading all these demands, are protected, and that commitments made by governments and international organizations are again that they're being held accountable to it. When we're talking about accountability, it is, um, I think, for me, the key, the key issue is the question of number. We have to have clear targets in terms of what is it that, um, that we're aiming at reaching, and, um, and yeah, take it from there. When you, when you say numbers, do you mean like as in, so if we're looking at targets, it's, it's number of women involved in certain negotiations or number of women involved in, in budget, in, you know, budget committees. Are those the kind of numbers like that, that, that you're thinking of? I'm thinking mostly funding in terms of how much funding is dedicated to women-led organizations, because I think this is really where the discourse and the practice uh, shift paths a lot. There's a lot of conversation about the key role played by women, how it is important to ensure that women are empowered, that women groups are put in, in leadership positions. But then when it comes to actual funding on the ground, there is a million excuse that is then uh, brought up as to why we do not see this translated in terms of uh, resources going directly in the hands of women. So I think this this is really um, a key a key part of what accountability is. Say uh, on online here that you know people are saying that they're 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 pointing out exactly what is being discussed here the the fact that there's talk but getting it to translate into actual actions and the numbers that you're talking about uh, in terms of funding often does. Can I just step back a little bit and to and what all too often? Question here, then. Dean, I don't think we could hear your question. I Internet broke up a little bit. So let's repeat it. I was you. You mentioned the kind of excuse. I could barely hear Jane. I don't know with uh, some of you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. I just cut out there for a second. Um, I apologize. Sorry, Zara. I just very quick for why some of the functions. What are the kind of excuses that that that, that are often used? Ex just to make sure I understand, excuses used. Um, in order not to fund women-led organization? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I, you know, you'd mentioned excuses that sometimes mm -hmm. that can block, you know, the talk and the promises actually trans translating into real action on the ground and the numbers and uh, the, the, the funding for women. What are the kind of excuses that we tend to hear? Um, that we can't get to them. How do we get to them? They're, uh, they're in, in, in distant areas, they're in distant zones, we don't know who they are, uh, what type of due diligence um, can, we, uh, can we implement in order to get to them, capacities, financial capacities. Um, not being there, systems. And I think um, this is really what women's funds uh, have been striving to achieve for the past 35 plus years in terms of, so the local, the regional, the global funds that have been exerting incredible efforts to ensure that funding goes directly to groups that are led by women. And we talk to, and then we have 
trust-based conversation about what type of uh, what type of support, what type of uh, of partnership can we have together in terms of uh, different additional uh, support that is needed for capacity? Because we know the incredible impact that women human rights groups have on the ground uh, have on the ground, uh, the gaps that they're filling uh, because of shortcomings from government, and so this is really what uh, the raison d'être, the, the the reason of existing of Women's Fund is to ensure that resources are put in the hands of, uh, of women in order for them to implement their own solutions and that these resources are flexible and multi-year because uh, if not when a crisis hit, women's groups are left scrambling uh, for resources to respond or they use their own resources which are incredibly uh, limited. And so I think this is... Um, this is really what, what's key is that women's funds know the realities um, on the ground, national ones, especially regional, global ones. They know who to who to go to and they know what's safe, right? Because another th something another thing we hear is we don't know how to get funding there with the crackdown against organizations, with uh, uh, with all the closing down of civil society space. And so with the relationships, with the type of systems that are in place, it's also uh, important um, to have these conversations in terms of how do we ensure that resources are transferred to groups that need them in a way that is uh, that is safe for them. Thank you so much, Zahara. And I just I have one final question uh, for Hibak here. Um, Hibak, do you think the dialogue for integrating gender into peace negotiations and planning has changed over recent years and has there been any sign of improvement and, and what can we do to build upon it? I, I missed part of your question but uh, the question was uh, if you could just repeat it I'm sorry. How, do, you, do you feel as though the, the, the conversation around, um, ar around or the dialogue for integrating gender into peace negotiations has changed and how do we build on that? Yes, I think uh, it's just like many other you know, lingos that nobody seems to understand, but we all fell in love with it and work towards women should be at the table. And when women go to the table, when uh, you know, militias are told, bring the woman uh, to the table, they bring their own women who are just basically look like women, but they don't have an agenda of a woman. And the government does the same thing. So we always say, yes, women would go to the table, but they will be the tablecloth because nobody would really take them seriously. Now, since that, uh, you know, the time of for the last 20 years of 13, 20, I think 13, 25 made a difference. 13, 25 did not make the difference that we wanted, but it opened up the dialogue. It normalized that women, meaningful women, should participate. So um, yes, before 13, 25, that was not even, that discussion was not, uh, you know, that the, uh, having women participate in these dialogues was not open for discussion. Now it's open for discussion. It's a question of fighting and having national action plans, political uh, commitment, uh, political will, uh, the resources for it. That is, uh, that is definitely changing. And of course, you know, all the research that has been done, this is where, I feel like you know the compact encompasses everything: the research, the the the, the, the women's organizations, uh, the work they are doing, uh, governments coming together. Hopefully, this will will speed it up. Now, uh, we talk about we need women envoys. We need you know, but uh, uh, we, we need women, meaningful women to participate, and that has to come you know, from the constituency, from the ground, from, you know, women who have the credibility, who are trusted, who actually can make a difference. Peace is not going to be made at the table and then that's it, you have peace. Somebody has to go there to enforce it and to implement it and to do that. And it could, it would be women because they're the ones that they're the foundation of that society and they're the ones who are trusted. And I think somebody mentioned the fact that they, yeah, I think it was uh, Mavic that said, you know, that it's in the DNA of women to be, uh, you know, to be great uh, crisis uh, managers and should really be there. So uh, the dialogue is changing, but then you, your question should ask me, uh, okay, so the language has changed, it's there, but then you should ask me and say, is it really being effective? No, it's not being effective. If you look at the Arab region, we have only three countries that have their national action plans. Four, you know, one that's attempting to, whereas at, out of the 22 countries, so there is a still a problem. There's a problem of resource. There's a problem of political will. There's a, all kinds of problems. So we're working towards it. 
it has changed in terms of the discussion opening up that dialogue. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we have to think out of the box. This is another way that we really are not going to wait for another 10 years so women can actually participate in the peace, even though every study and everyone says that they have to be, we have got to find out of the box. We have to find, we have to put there is this is a mandate you know let's not wait for the governments to appoint who should be there or the militia who should be there we have got to create another way another mechanism where women are going to be participating in that uh, you know um, in that meeting and, and and you know and they have the mandate we just have to make a case for that and you know the beat goes on just like everything else when it comes to women's rights what can we do Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for everybody for answering uh, those questions. And, and thank you to the audience members for sharing such helpful questions that really aid us in pushing forward this conversation. I hope the discussion uh, has helped us all better understand uh, not just why this compact is important, but what can help, what, what can help us achieve it. Uh, I'd now like to, to give our discussions one final chance to reflect on today's uh, discussion in a one minute lightning round. I'd like each of you to just share one final thought or your reflection in a minute or less uh, on, on today's discussion and something to really leave us with. So uh, I will start off with Mavic. Um, if you wanna just jump in and give us your, your one minute roundup. I'll try one minute. I just wanted to, re yeah, I'll, I'll start by reinforcing some of um, the points made by Hibak. Uh, we, we, yeah, obviously we still have a lot of challenges in terms of really ensuring women's meaningful participation, given the fact that the framework of official peace negotiations remain to be problematic. The premium, the premium on who gets to the table are those uh, is given to those who are waging the war, not to those who are waging the peace. Waging the war meaning the military and the rebel groups, not the way those who are waging the peace, who are usually women peace builders, especially local peace builders. But I also would like to celebrate some of our accomplishments, which is of which are of course inspired by our advocacy on the women peace and security agenda. We have peace agreements that are strong uh, in, you know, uh, in, in gender perspectives. Topmost among this is the Colombian peace agreement with the uh, uh, FARC, uh, the uh, Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. The um, South Sudan peace agreement has 35%, you know, calls for a 35% quota on women's leadership and participation in decision-making. The, the peace agreement in the Philippines also has um, a, uh, an important part on, on women's participation, not just in decision-making, but in development overall. But we should, yeah, I'm, I'm sure all of us would, would you know, jump in to say, it's another story in terms of implementing this peace agreement and uh, you know, making them a reality. And, and many of these peace agreement um, are easily violated even before the ink that, that was used to sign them has dried. And that is one important, um, important action for the compact. Ensure that this peace agreement, especially those that have strong gender component are translated from words to action, from rhetoric to realities. And we need to translate the commitments into achievements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mavic. Uh, next is Zahra. Thanks, Jane. Recently, a report published by the World Bank was brought to my attention as uh, it predicts that the overall global gender gap will close in 99.5 years. Yes, 100 years to close the gender gap. And so I have many questions about this number, and I'm sure you all do too. One of these questions is, how did we come up with a vaccine against the 2019 novel coronavirus in less than a year and yet are comfortable predicting that for gender justice to be achieved, something for which we all know the cures, it will take one more century. This is not okay, this does not make sense. And yet it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy 
unless we spend less time on hyperbolic discourses promising the sky to women and girls only to turn around and fail to commit to concrete transformations that would ensure a sustainable and equitable work and indeed save their lives. Thank you. daughters or our great granddaughters or our great great granddaughters either way it sounds uh, pretty depressing and as you say unacceptable um so thank you so much Sarah. um so next we'll turn to eleanor thanks so many um amazing uh contributions on this panel and i i have thoughts on all of them so i'll, I'll try and keep it brief but um, just touching on the peace agreements, uh, you know, there there are absolutely a lot of, of reasons to celebrate, but I think what we're really being challenged with is that, as Mavic said, it's not being turned into implementation. So, you know, even though the peace agreement on South Sudan called for, you know, a 35% affirmative action quota, you know, it's been years and it, it hasn't been met and it's not even close to being met yet. Um, and, you know, we don't need to look farther than Yemen, where, where you're located. And, you know, the, the, you know, severe failing of including women in the in the Yemen peace process. So I think there's there's a lot of work to do, and I think it points to the reason why um, we need this compact. So just a you know a few final thoughts on this compact, uh, Zara. The 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 hundred years that the World Bank um, said for for gender equality. I, I actually saw today that I think they've actually bumped that up to 136 years. So if there was if there was a reason for us to double down on our work, um, you know that that's it. <laughs> 136 years. And if there was a reason that we need intergenerational collaboration, that's also it because that's a multi generational effort. Um, and on that point, I would say when we invite youth to the table to make sure that they are recognized as more than just youth experts. You know, we are thematic experts on lots of issues and to not pigeonhole us into, um, you know, the sole representation of, a, of our identities, even though that's important. Um, we are valuable contributors just for the, the sake of being there. We don't always need to be talking about youth issues. Um, so the last final thought I have on the compact is that it is broad. You know, women, peace and security and humanitarian, these are these are broad concepts. And if we want our work to be concrete, we are going to need to do things differently. We've seen these types of initiatives before we've seen. Um, and while it's moved the dial, it hasn't moved it far enough because, you know, that gap has moved from 100 to 136 years. So the way that we can do that is really being led by civil society. I think there's there's no other way that we can advance the compact of the work in the next five years if civil society is not leaving, leading. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much to the, my fellow panelists for the contributions today. I've, it was so lovely uh, speaking alongside you and thank you, Jane, for the moderation. Um, I, I can't wait to work with you for the next five years to, to really try and make this compact successful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eleanor. You make a great point there about South Sudan and the difference between goals and, and actual implementation. And it just immediately makes me think of, of uh, Afghanistan right now and those crucial vital peace talks that are going on where women are vastly underrepresented in those talks and many of the negotiations going on in back rooms and women pushed out. But there's a, there's a, there's, there are much, much efforts amongst to turn that around. So, so thank you for, for bringing that up that example. Um, we'll move now to Sharon. Thanks, Jane. And, and maybe just to start by saying, you know, whether it's the signing of peace agreements or whether it's, you know, the, the end of a state of emergency after a natural disaster or a uh, humanitarian crisis, that's not when the work ends. That's when the work starts. And, and so I think it's just critical that when we talk about women's leadership and agency, we're talking about the support in a very holistic way. We've seen in Bougainville, that you know the work of those women who brokered peace is still continuing on the ground today and we see you know one year after a category five hurricane in Vanuatu just last year the women are still talking about the impact um, that that cyclone has had on on their development priorities so it can't be business as usual anymore and the fact that we have this compact that presents that triple nexus approach is just so critical. Um, at the end of the day, I think there, there are many key issues, um, in, including financing, but 
what I did um, middle of last year was actually through our, our Pacific network, ask, ask Pacific Island women and young women, what were the key issues? So very quickly, they talked about having accessible and inclusive communication, having safe spaces and, and having the finances to, to help them do the work on the ground. But they also talked about the localization agenda, helping support and build strong national networks of women from different vantage points, um, not just one young woman, but young women working in different areas, um, valuing women's indigenous and local knowledge, and then re recognizing that women's organizations are critical if we want to meet the goals of the peace, security, development, and humanitarian agenda. And at the end of the day, it's got to be intersectional. It's got to be inclusive. Thanks, Jane. Thanks so much, Saren. Um, you're absolutely right. Those, those are really important insights. Um, and we'll, we'll just uh, go now, uh, finally, to Hibak. Yeah, of course. Um, I agree with everything that everyone said. I think it's all perfect and wonderful. I would emphasize the, uh, you know, the question of accountability is extremely important. You cannot, every few years, come up with another resolution, another resolution, when you haven't done anything with the thousand other resolutions that you have done. Case in point, the woman, peace and security, there has got to be a mechanism for accountability. We need that. Let me go back to, let me just close it with the compact. I think compact is extremely important. As activists and women's organizations, we have been complaining about governments because they don't have the political will. Uh, they, don't, they cannot implement you know, these resolutions and other laws. We have been you know, uh, complaining about the UN because the UN is just talking to itself or those that they're more familiar or safe. Uh, we have been uh, you know, complaining about the fund, lack of funding for all of this uh, you know, uh, work that's being done. So now you have a, a place where all of that is coming together to work together. You have the governments that have to be pushed, that has to be, uh, that, that have to be, uh, I should called or pushed is the wrong word, but anyway, whatever it is, just basically encourage maybe is a more diplomatic word to really implement these resolutions. Uh, you have uh, the activists, you know, who basically, you know, would have the access to hopefully to the governments and to the UN to mainstream that work that's going. And at the same time, that's going to inform the reality on the ground on what's going on, because that should be supported. We as civil society who are in the compact are not basically, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, you know, tweaking ourselves or, uh, or adjusting ourselves to what the UN wants us, we want them to adjust to what we want because it's not what we want, it's the reality on the ground. So we will bring the voices of the women and the people on the ground so that whatever is in the compact is a people's agenda with tooth. The tooth, somebody asked about the tooth. The tooth, the tooth is the civil society and the women's organizations who are in the compact. That is what's going to give the tooth because we will be pressuring, we will be pushing because we have you know, what it takes, we, 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 we are the best, uh, you know, people who are trained in a disaster. So I think I have to comment and congratulate uh, the wisdom of the UN to bring everyone together under the compact. And we have, they have our commitment to work together because I feel like this is one area where we can all, you know, um, uh, we, we can all bring our, um, our, our work and our resource and our energy and our commitment and our trust because we are coming in and just checking it out. We're not just there so that we can just be on the checklist. Yes, and a women's organizations to come back. Yes, and the civil society, yes. No, we are there so that we can build trust and see where it goes from there. So thank you. I muted myself there because uh, this city is just starting to wake up here in, in Yemen and it's getting noisy. But thank you so much, Hibak, for those points. Um, and, and, and for everybody, I mean, I, I, I want to thank everybody on the panel, all of the discussants for such an engaging and interactive discussion today. I mean, we've gone over so much ground um, in, and it is groundbreaking work that everybody is embarking on. Uh, the premium given to those waging war over those waging peace does seem to be the overall arching theme and whether or not that's financial
financial or whether or not that's access, whether or not that is leadership roles. That's really, really been an important theme here as well as perhaps it is it has been has been mentioned that the funding issue funding for peace versus for war especially for the women in local grassroots organizations uh, thank you so much to everybody uh, for for, for uh, discussing those points and bringing bringing a little bit more clarity uh, and 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 unity on on on, on all of these points around uh, this particular compact and i'd like to 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 thank also un women the governments of Mexico and France, the board and catalytic members, but most of all, the audience and contributed and, and listened to these important points. And I, I really, really look forward to hearing how the conversation continues. So thank you so much.